Hello and welcome to Unstress. My name is Dr. Ron Ehrlich. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land in which I am recording this podcast, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Well, today we are going to be exploring climate change again, and we're today is um, we hear so many, so much bad news, so many prophets of doom. Uh, it's quite depressing, actually, when you sit and listen to it. And yet, uh, there are solutions out there, and um, it's interesting always to hear those. And I think a, a positive story is an important one. And my guest today, I welcome back, Dr. Christos. Miliotis. He's a medical practitioner and he describes himself as an ecopreneur. Now, I enjoy talking to Christos because he brings positive, can do, optimistic, multidisciplinary approaches to tackling climate change. And this podcast always wants to remind ourselves, and I think we do need to remind ourselves regularly, that a holistic approach to life, to the health of both the individual and the planet, is the only way to realistically be looking at things. A holistic context, as the legendary Alan Savory, a guest on an earlier podcast says, is what should sit above and be the foundation of every decision we make, whether we are individuals, a community, a company, a country, a globe. The holistic context is what should be the overriding principle. Christos draws on fields of microbiology, mycology, which is about funguses, botany, ecology, social science, hydrology, the science of the water cycle, climatology, plant physiology, nutrition, plant-soil interactions as a way of also understanding and mimicking nature. We have to understand nature in its integrated whole. And, you know, I've introduced you to many integrative practitioners, psychologists, gastroenterologists, cardiologists, doctors, but an integrated approach to life is a really worthwhile uh, thing to be doing and a message that we constantly focus on. The problem with not just our healthcare or climate policy or politics for that matter is our approach tends to be very reductionist. I have A, therefore I will do B. Ignoring that at least all the other elements or letters of the alphabet represent other things we need or should take into account. We try to solve problems caused by this reductionist approach to nature and health, for that matter, by being even more reductionist. And it's not working very well if human health and planetary health is anything to go by. Look, uh, Christos goes into a lot of detail and uh, we are sharing screens here. So if you are watching this on YouTube, there are some interesting images that he shares with us, but I do try to describe this for those that are just listening. I hope you enjoyed this conversation I had with Dr. Christos Miliotis. Welcome back, Christos. And Ron, it's always a great pleasure, I assure you. <laughs> oh, good. Good. Now, Chris, there's there's so much we can talk, we're going to talk about today. I've been looking forward to catching up again. I um I, I know this is a passion of yours, and this is seeing greenhouse gas emissions as an untapped resource. And I think you also say, and I love this, I'm intrigued by this. Would you believe we can make sky diamonds? Please explain. Yes. Well, I like. Being in Australia, I want to turn everything upside down and uh, we need to reframe and reimagine greenhouse gases as not the enemy, but an untapped resource, a profound untapped resource. And there's a lot of work in not only just carbon capture and storage, but carbon capture and utilisation. Uh, I'm only taking this as a kind of an example not that I'm advocating making diamonds out of carbon dioxide, but the reality is there is a, a company and I don't have any shares. So there's no conflict of interest. It's called, um, oh my God, <laughs> I have to get that later. Anyhow, the company, look it up, Sky Diamonds, what they do at 800 degrees centigrade, and I'm not sure how many atmospheres pressure can produce Sky Diamond or diamonds out of CO2. Um, 
and uh, they're planning to scale up to produce a thousand carats a month. Wow. So um, they're obviously flawless, as you know, natural uh, diamonds uh, have got, undergone pressure and heat over a period of time to create the diamonds, but these are absolutely flawless. Um, unless you're a, a diamond evaluator, you wouldn't tell the difference, but it acts as an example, in a kind of more, you know, glamorous bling type way that we can use these resources. But my uh, work over the last 18 years has gravitated towards bringing the greenhouse gases into the soil primarily. Now you can obviously CO2, you can do that via plants, but our microbial inoculant also takes directly CO2 from the atmosphere. And I might've mentioned this example before, uh, there was a, someone told me that they had a ute uh, filled with compost or soil, compost, I should think. They weighed in at Newcastle and it had a certain tonnage. They went to Sydney weigh-in station and it was increased. Now, the, there were microbes on board the ute tray or, and they were actually harvesting CO2 from the atmosphere. So if you extend that idea to not only harvesting CO2 via plants and now microbes and fungi, uh, but also uh, methane, you can use what's called methanotropes, which attract um, uh, methane and, and form other compounds, which are not, form nitrogen and are bioavailable. Similarly, uh, well, with nitro nitrogen dioxide, which is a significant greenhouse gas, we can't. We can harvest nitrogen directly by using nitrogen fixing uh, spores uh, and plants, uh, the legumes in particular. Uh, but if we then harvest directly uh, nitrogen from the atmosphere, we're therefore not using nitrogen fertilizers, which can oxidize up. To, a significant amount can oxidize to form nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide is a problem because it erodes the greenhouse, uh, sorry, it erodes the uh, um, uh, ozone. Yeah, ozone, thank you. Uh, senior moment there. And uh, thank you for bringing me I was just checking whether you're listening. <laughs> oh, yeah, I am, I am. Thanks very much for backing me up. But, but interestingly, when you put nitrogen fertilizer in a synthetic form, it can consume, for every kilogram of nitrogen fertilizer, can consume 12 kilograms of carbon. That's the black gold. And we're losing it. We're losing it in, in many ways, and hopefully we'll come to that. So clearly we can use these greenhouse gases as benefits. I became interested in CO2 utilization and monetization because we produce hydrogen from fermenting organic uh, agricultural waste, but a, a percentage of that is then producing carbon dioxide. We can easily uh, separate that by using membranes because the hydrogen molecule is smaller than the carbon dioxide molecule. We can compartmentalize them. CO2, we can put that in cement and improve the cement curing process with less water and make it harder. We can use it for beverage drinks, we can use it for sky diamonds. We can use it for building materials. In fact, that's what I'm working on uh, as, a, as a process. So I won't go into all the details there, but it's interesting that we need to reimagine and monetize greenhouse gases and seize them as assets. I, I call it sort of mining the sky. You know, we're, we're adding to greenhouse gases by extracting industrialized farming chemical system but we can kind of reverse engineer and actually mine these elements from the atmosphere. It, when I mentioned the hydrogen project, um, I, it's actually a reverse photosynthesis process. So instead of, uh, so I won't go into details there, but we're reversing even photosynthesis to yield hydrogen. So that's powerful. And just to finish that off, we're working with using the, uh, the residual uh, fiber to make climate proof buildings, which have been already approved for being fire resistant, earthquake resistant, hurricane resistant. And this Friday, I'm actually talking to the architect in Malaysia 
and make it flood resistant so it'll actually float with the rising tide. Obviously, there's limits to all of those things, but we need to be really, in, uh, you know, uh, use uh, the problem of climate change and solve it uh, for our building as well. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things I like about this thought is that so often the narrative is very negative and a doom and gloom. And, and I'm reminded of, uh, I think, uh, he's probably a great mentor to you too, Alan Savory, yes. you know, who, who said, uh, it's not the resource that's the problem, it's how the resource is managed. And, yeah. uh, and you know, this is all about that sort of holistic context yeah. about everything. So I, I love the idea of, yes, we have a problem, uh, but let's find out, let's turn that into a resource. I know another thing that is very uh, is fresh in all of our minds, particularly in Australia, but also in other parts of the world, and that of floods. Floods are front and centre now, and and we've and, and you, you know given the mega floods that have been spawned, you know you, you touched on this housing. Can we build climate change proof house and sequester carbon at the same time? You mentioned that. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've been working, um, I was invited to join a, a, a enterprise in Malaysia called HempTech Asia. And I was invited to be their scientific advisor. And I've been sort of evaluating or incorporating other uh, technologies to make it what I call the eco powerhouse. And the watch that space, the eco powerhouse, we say is grown by the sun and powered by the sun, literally. So we're using fast growing plants, which sequester carbon. We then uh, use the microbes through a fermentation process and the liquid, uh, if I can uh, do a screen share, the liquid is used to regenerate land. Okay, well, look for our, um, for those that are listening, uh, we'll, we'll give a good commentary as we go, but this is also on YouTube and we're getting a lot of, a lot of uh, views on YouTube. So. Let's just pause for a second and we'll share this screen. Okay. So, Chris, if you go to the bottom of the YouTube, of, of the Zoom thing, the share screen will come up. That, that's it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I'll leave it in this format. Um, I'll go to the end of the slides, which is really powerful. Uh, some people can't believe their own eyes, but if you look at that slide, that's a mining site in China. And you can see before it's desolate. Not only is it desolate, it's toxic as well. It's got pesticides, herbicides, a whole bit. And you wouldn't, it's very hard to regenerate or revegetate that. We took the liquid water from the fermentation to produce hydrogen. And you can see on the left, if you go to the left slide on the left hand side, you can see how much ground cover there is and the height is up to mid-thigh. So, Chris, so let me just, for our listener, say we're looking at two photos here of the same site. Correct, yeah. And on the one side, it is literally just desolate, yeah. a mine site which is completely bare and you're saying is toxic. Yes. And on the left-hand side, the same, same land, yes. um, we are looking at some very lush growth there. Yes, and and um, and and go, so go on. Explain to us how that change occurred again. Well, put it in context. It's not the whole, we didn't do the whole revegetation because there's thousands of hectares in that mining site, but we took a portion as a revegetation project. And on the left hand side of the slide, you see on the extreme left where we use the water after fermentation from two microbes yielding hydrogen. We use that water as a fertilizer or a growth plant stimulant, and it covered 100% of the ground without irrigation and grew to a but to mid thigh level. On the right hand side, you can see some pipes, uh, some um, irrigation drip lines. Yes, There's probably it's very scattered uh, vegetative cover, and it's not as high, probably mid um, mid um, lower leg height. So there's a big difference in that. I do have other slide where you can see a person standing at. Let's see. just focus on this because the the right hand side is the a photo you're showing is the desolate yes. landscape. The left hand side is the revegetated one. But within yes. that left hand side, 
it is divided into two. Yes. And and where you have not done, where you've just done your your uh, utilization of those hydrogen and and uh, again, what was the, what was utilized on that on that more lush side? Okay. Okay, well, we use, uh, you know, a feedstock is, is fibre, you know, agricultural waste. Um, mm -hmm. We add two microbes. We use a few nutrients as well to uh, help multiply the microbes. We take that whole slosh, <laughs> that whole liquid residue, and put it on the field. Now, the comparison is uh, from another company's fertiliser. So we, we had a comparison, and you can see a significant difference. Yeah, because on the right-hand side... So this this a company fertilizer in this regenerated space is actually quite sparse and not very not yeah. very high. The vegetation you can actually see yeah. the irrigation pipe there, yeah. but on, on your side it's very clearly far more lush and uh, and with, and green. With no irrigation and uh, with respect to the company that the the company did the fertilizer, they obviously you could see they weren't winning, so they put in some pipes as well to try. Speed it up, but I don't want to. You know, I, I want to do that with respect. But the point is, some people have actually seen the photos and don't believe it is real. It's very dramatic, and I don't have the right photo to show the inventor of the hydrogen production process standing in it, so you can see how high it is. But it's you know, it's it's at least getting towards a meter. So that is a profound thing uh, that we can use to put in context. So we're we're growing fast growing plants like canaf or hemp, which is better known. We then take the fiber after it's chopped up, add the microbes, add a nutrient brew with it, and we produce the hydrogen. We then take the liquid residue to make the fertilizer. We then take the residual fiber. Because the carbohydrate portion has been consumed by the microbes to produce hydrogen, what you're left is the structural fibers of lignin and silica fibers, which actually increases the surface area for then bonding with our bio epoxy resin, which is made from renew renewable sources as non-toxic. And it's as strong as anything. Uh, testing with a ballistic company in America showed a five millimeter thick film or sheet stopped the bullet. So they actually can, can make a body armor from it. Wow. So it's incredibly strong. Therefore, we can get very light buildings so that they can float on, on, on posts, which can be um, articulated to float with the flood. Uh, obviously, there's a limit to that. But it actually, uh, the company that's based in Malaysia, they've, on their website, they, um, they show firing a ballistic at this uh, military outpost and it didn't even penetrate the wall. Well, which I'm sure in America is a great uh, selling point. Uh, well, yeah, in, unfortunately in Ukraine. So. Oh, okay, yes. Now, listen, that, that's so interesting. Uh, you've raised this issue about building houses that float, and, of course, there are things called houseboats. Yes. And, uh, I, you know, this is another one of... I, lo I look at all these houses in northern New South Wales and, you know, you've just got to feel for those people that have lost so much... Yeah. And yet the logistics of moving from the land they own and, and moving and rebuilding, what an interesting idea to, to take yeah. the concept of houseboat and build it around a house yeah. that can float. <laughs> Actually putting it, you know, I mean, that, that in itself is a wonderful... It's houseboat. It's anchored to the ground. Yeah. A particular posts where you've got collars, if you like, which there's, there's different solutions and I'm yet to talk to the architect. But if the flood comes in, it will rise. Also, it's important to realise that the uh, biocomposite material is waterproof. So you exclude the water if you, if you seal everything off, but it will literally float up with a, with a rising flood level. Depending on how high your posts are, there's a limit to that. So if you're getting mega, mega floods, that won't work, but it's it's firmly anchored to the ground. Mm, mm, it's mm. Sitting on the ground initially, it's not a house, but it's a land-based uh, dwelling. Yeah. Okay, now are so, we... Just to say, every component, it just worked out to be, every component we're putting in to make the biocomposite sequesters carbon in and of itself. So it's a majorly carbon negative building. Tell us about your new initiative, the H2 Cubed. Is that what that is about? 
Yeah, well, H2 stands for Hibiscus cananabinus. Its common name is Canaf. It's incredibly fast growing and you can grow three crops a year, depending on your rainfall and soil. And uh, it's very prolific. Um, so I'm working with the Malaysian group and the Malaysian uh, Canaf Association. I'll be visiting there when I can get there. Um, so it's very fast growing. It's also very nutritious. The leaf can be made into a flower, a high protein flower. It's also a good fodder crop and every part, part of the plant can be used. Yeah. So canaf and hemp are the same thing? No, canaf, canaf is hibiscus cananabinus Can and hemp is obviously hemp. Yeah, um, okay. So H2 stands for either hemp or hibiscus cananabinus. The uh, H2 obviously stands for hydrogen and cubed is kind of to the power of three, meaning we make three different products, in fact, more byproducts, but cubed also connotes building. So what are the other things? We're, we're sequestering carbon, we're producing uh, fertilizer, we're producing hydrogen, and then we're producing and other byproducts, and we're also producing um, buildings. Well, H2, yeah. Well, I know this is, and then this is one of the reasons I enjoy talking to you, Chris, because I think, like me, you you too suffer from uh, chronic enthusiasm and optimism, and you say um, we can have climate change covered, and and I guess this is part of how we do that. Yeah, well, well, basically, the the framing of that is cover crops will have climate change covered, and if I can go to the screen share, what was profound and i must refer this work is from uh well what inspired me is walter yana j-e-h-n-e -E. he's done he's, uh, he's at anu isn't he he was yes uh he and csro he has got many uh uh youtube videos which are really worth getting into and i spent quite a lot of time understanding and digesting it so here we have if you can see the slide, you've got a cover crop on the extreme left and um, the temperature, the surface temperature is 19.5. When you slash that as a kind of mulch, it's 24.5, but the bare soil is 43.8. Now that <laughs> itself is a significant difference, but the thermodynamics is such, the amount of heat that's re-radiated back to the atmosphere is equal to the surface temperature to the fourth power, not four times to the fourth power. So that's a lot more heat coming off the surface. Now, if you look at Australia, it's desert and it's reflecting a lot of heat. Our average atmospheric temperature is 1.4 degrees, not one or as approaching 1.1 world average, because we've got a heat dome. We've got a desert reflecting all that heat. So it's not only the greenhouse gases, but it's the land management makes a difference whether you cool or heat the planet. So simply all the ground covered all the, the time will have climate change covered. Mm. Now, uh, you can do it in every context of agriculture. So, so here we have a wonderful shot of... A well, Chris, Chris, can you just go back to that last slide? Because I do want to, for those that are audio on this, Describe that we are looking literally at a piece of land that is probably just a, a few meters wide. Yes, and yes. and we've got vegetation that is probably a few uh, three hundred millimeters high or, or a foot or two high, and the yes. surface temperature there is nineteen and a half degrees centigrade. Yes. Then next to that, we're looking at the the that having been mowed and some mulch on the ground, and that is. 24 degrees, literally next to it. So yes. we've gone from 19 and a half degrees centigrade to 24.5 degrees centigrade. And literally next to that is bare ground, yes. uh, which is 43.8 degrees centigrade. So within, within the distance of a few metres, the ground cover, the temperature at ground cover varies from 19 and a half degrees centigrade to 43.8 degrees centigrade. I mean, that's a phenomenal difference. It's around 24 centimetres centigrade hotter. Yeah, but if you take that uh, 10 degrees difference, that it's actually more than that, but uh, it's uh, 14 degrees. 
Uh, but if you take that difference, then you, um, sorry, it's it's more than that, it's 20, 24 degrees. 24 degrees, yeah. Um, but if you then look at the amount of heat that's released, it's equal to the surface temperature, the power of four. Right. It's massive. So there is a solution to have cover crops. Yes. So, uh, so again, I, and I think this is such an important point that it bears repeating because you're saying that if you take the surface temperature and then translate that into the effect that that surface temperature has on atmospheric temperature, it's a significant increase on that, on that as well. Four, to the power of four, you're saying? Yes, to the fourth power. Four. Now, add to that two other factors, which is critical. I believe that we need to revolutionise agriculture by having every agricultural enterprise with cover crops, be it pasture cropping, and I'll go into that, be it horticulture, be it viticulture, be it silver pasture, be it agroforestry, all the ground must be covered all of the time. Nature does that yes. <laughs> all the time. Now, two other benefits. There are others, but I'll just emphasize the main ones. Plants transpire. When a plant transpires, the amount of heat required to take the water that was in the plant to a gaseous water vapour, it requires 596 calories to take one gram of water from liquid to gaseous state. It's called the latent heat effect. So you're actually having a cooling effect through transpiration. Now, it's calculated that if we increase the transpiration on the planet by cover, covering the ground with vegetation, a mere 5% increase in transpiration will stabilise the climate, full stop. It'll stop it keep going up, right? So, so this transpiration is literally, we're going back to high school biochemistry here, and isn't it interesting that actually I know Elon Musk has issued a million-dollar reward for anybody that can come up with a climate solution, whereas most of us in year seven learnt about photosynthesis and transpiration, the movement of water through a plant and into the atmosphere, and actually there's the solution. Well, it's one of the solutions. One of the solutions. But there's more. There's more. Oh, wait, there's more. Yeah. Now, we are losing, and this is conservative, the range of estimated soil topsoil loss through erosion is between 25 billion tonnes to 75 billion tonnes, and in particular in Australia, it's very high. For every tonne of wheat we produce, we're, we're losing 14 tonnes of soil. So we're losing soil at an extraordinary fast rate, and estimates are at current rates we will have degraded or desertified 95% of the soil by 2050, or we've got 60 years of soil left that's functional. So, Chris, just again, and, and I, because you're saying so much here, and I want, I want there's so many important points here, that soil erosion is, and we covered this with Alan Savory many a few years ago, back, and he said the biggest export in America is actually soil, and it ain't coming back. Correct. But you're saying between 25 to 75 billion tonnes of soil is being eroded globally every year. Yeah. Now, if we take the lower estimate of 25 billion tonnes, that gets oxidised to carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide, which, of course, are greenhouse gases. But it goes further. The dust that's released, uh, the water vapour will nucleate around uh, the dust particle, right? But in, in that form, it's hydrophobic, meaning it won't coalesce to form raindrops. It, they, they won't come together. You've seen a dry soil, which is, uh, you know, you try to put water on it, it just runs off the surface like a water duck's back. Yeah. Well, we're, we're doing the same in the atmosphere we're actually creating hazes from soil particles that have gone into wind through wind erosion and go up and up and up, and that won't produce rain. Right. That is so, so interesting. That's a very interesting uh, if uh, we look point. At the whole cycles. If we're looking at the water cycle, when a, a, a water drop forms from millions of these, um, at least 10 millions of these, micronucleated uh, water vapour coming in to condense to form a, a, a raindrop, when you get cloud formation, you're actually reflecting 23% of the incoming radiation to the 
planet. So it's like an umbrella. We need that umbrella shading effect to reflect heat back, right? And trees do that masterfully by releasing volatile substances and bacteria, aerobacteria, uh, aerobacter, which seed clouds as well. There's three things that seed clouds. There's salt crystals from the ocean spray, ice, and, and bacteria primarily from trees. The Amazon has its own closed system. That's why it's called a rainforest because it actually produces rain. Yes. Trees produce rain. When you plant trees, you, you slow down flood or translocation of water on the surface. You get deeper penetration of, of water because of the st soil structuring effect of the roots, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. We need to keep all of the ground covered all the time. If we just did that, it would be significant. So we're, we're just to go over it, we're cooling the surface to stop that surface temperature to power four. Yeah. We're stopping the erosion, which causes uh, uh, brown hazes, which stop coalition of coalescing of, of water drop vapor into clouds. And 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 we're also increasing transpiration. Yes. It's so interesting, uh, Christoph, because another guest we've had on is Terry McCosker, yes. uh, who's into regenerative uh, agriculture. He's been teaching it for years. And he said that... Uh, Ruminant urine has, uh, ha has plant growth hormone in it, and then it stimulates a, um, a microbe called Pseudonomus syringi to, for, to, to seed the, the, the rain. And uh, this is, wow. you know, and, and when I look at this bare ground to the right here, the other thing that comes to mind is that when it does rain, um, it, it could take 20 or 30 minutes for the moisture to penetrate and in the process remove so much soil, which goes back to your 25 to 75 billion tonnes of soil. Uh, but it also, we not only lose soil, but we lose water, which kind of is the whole thing about ground cover and organic matter in soil as well. Absolutely. And the thing is, when you have stagnant water on hard ground, that evaporates very quickly where when it goes through the soil, through the roots, through the plant, which has a cooling effect, you, you conserve the water. Simply, if you take the idea that greenhouse gases and the dominant greenhouse gas is water vapour. If we didn't have water vapour mantle over the earth, the earth would be 33 degrees cooler. It traps heat, but it's got out of balance. We've got more water vapour from a number of mechanisms. So water vapour is actually the point of agency. We need to work with the water cycle by building what's called the, the, the soil carbon sponge. The soil carbon sponge is a, a soil which is aerated. It's like a lung. It literally acts like a lung. But it also is a reservoir, like a sponge, can absorb water, but it can also have air in it at the same time. Now, the importance of that is if you imagine a, a pore or what formed by aggregates made by bacteria or fungi, that increases the surface area of the soil in which nutrients are attached to usually organic matter. And this is really important. The connection between the root zone and the soil, there's a transfer of nutrients two way. The plant makes carbohydrates, which feeds the soil microbiome. But the soil provides nutrients to the plant, and it does it in a highly titrated, regulated way. If the plant needs, say, a calcium molecule, it, the root will secrete a weak acid called carbonic acid. The hydrogen ions will displace the other cations of calcium, magnesium, whatever, in a regulated way and then make that calcium magnesium bioavailable to the plant. It's highly, mm. highly regulated. And Chris, do you know what I like about this discussion is because people will have heard the word nutrient dense foods yes. often, often, and, um, and it's not hard to make a plant look impressive by just feeding it two or three or three nutrients. What is it? Nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Yeah. Potassium. So, so, but with what you're describing, so many more of those trace elements are incorporated into the plant 
which either we eat or the animals that we eat eat. And that's how we end up getting the 40 or 50 or 60 elements that we need to be nutrient dense. And that's it at the coal face. It's not really the coal face. At the root face, where what's going on? Plants delivering sugar or carbohydrate to microbes in exchange for a, a well titrated exchange of trace elements. Yeah, which is highly specific to its needs. Um, the, That's the, beautiful. It's beautiful to hear that. Yeah, the, the important thing here is that um, when you give soluble f- fertilizers, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, which will bloat the cell up. Yep. So actually, why conventional food is not tasty, unless it's better into its genetics, is because you're buying salt and water. <laughs> Right now, what what? But it looks impressive. It looks impressive. The way you push the those mineralized, uh, solubilized or water soluble minerals elements into the plant is by an osmotic gradient. In other words, you have a higher concentration of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium outside. Then, the, there are two kinds of roots: There's the hair roots, which have a very fine uh, root-like structure. And therefore, the, the surface area is increased because it's got a smaller diameter. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. But the, the other roots are the drinking roots. They're the, they're, the, they're the ones that take up water primarily. And they work by having a high um, concentration inside, which means it'll draw in water because it's of the solutes inside the root. Right? Now, if you have highly soluble mineral fertilizers, they will go through the drinking roots and not through the hair roots. And it's totally unregulated. Now, what happens then is that those, that nutritional profile of the artificially fertilized plant, it's actually hydroponics. It's just the plant happens to be in soil rather than in a a pot, in a hydroponic factory, Hmm. right? So it's, it's hydroponics, it's just shifting nutrients via water into the plant what that does it weakens the plant and it puts out a different frequency which insects with their compound eyes see oh this is the this is the weak plant let's eat that one mm-hmm. and in all our work when we use microbes to create the right soil structure for the increased nutrient cycling we do get 30 percent increased nutrient density they are not interested in a healthy plant yeah. so isn't this so interesting again to say, yes, we can use superphosphate, those nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, and grow a plant, but it's inherently weak and is attracted to insects, which then require uh, pesticides, and yet still we take them to market. The alternative way is to improve the soil through, um, through this kind of, it's almost like an organic biodynamic approach which sets up for a very, not only a very healthy plant that isn't isn't easy pickings for the insects, but it's also better for us. I mean, that's a total win-win-win, isn't it? Apart from the chemical industry, which loses. Yeah, well, interestingly, because I've also been involved with cancer research, it's interesting that when a, a plant is eaten by, when they start to taste an organic plant, let's say, it will create secondary metabolites, which are bitter substances. Those secondary metabolites, all of them are selective anti-cancer agents. They will weed out rogue cancer cells in the body. Nice. But the other thing is, when you have a soil that has minimal till, low till, uh, uh, no till, when that plant is eaten and secretes the secondary metabolite, it sends chemical messages, just like our brain sends chemical messages, throughout the, the fungal networks, to all the surrounding plants to make secondary metabolites. Mm -hmm. You see, Chris, this is what I find so interesting. I know there's a whole ethical issue about eating animals because it's cruel and, you know, they deserve a life. But I I feel the same is true of plants. Just because they don't move doesn't mean they aren't sentient. Just because they don't speak our language, they actually communicate with each other, with other microbes, with other living things. I actually don't think we should eat anything, Chris. I think it's too cruel because we kill everything that we have to eat. 
What do you think? So you want to be a breatharian? <laughs> <laughs> a breatharian. I think it's the next way. I, we've gone through the vegetarian. Ve- vegetarian. I can't go with that. Vegan. Um, you know. Yeah. I think we're going to reduce ourselves to just having breath as our nutrient. Well, before we go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just couldn't resist. But, but you were describing. You're describing such a almost sentient being. Well, yeah, I mean, interestingly, and this is a divergence, but with our biodynamic processes, we actually make the soil intelligent and sentient. But that's a whole new chapter. Yeah, yeah. But I'll just finish on that. I'll just, I'll just to take that point up. Interestingly, the, the 504 preparation made from stinging nettle, Steiner said, who was the father of biodynamics, said the stinging nettle preparation makes the soil intelligent. So the plant can select what it needs specifically and not be dumbed down and force fed. But just on the point of mining the atmosphere, plants and microbes build soil, chemical fertilizers in time destroy soil. And I know that I spent three months traveling throughout China on slow trains and looked at the destruction of land from the green revolution that's happened most of the world, because you basically collapse the soil structure. You actually make the lung-like structure of the soil collapse. So it doesn't breathe and it's thirsty. And we open it up again by plowing, which destroys the fungal networks and the soil microbiome. So we're doing it all wrong. We, Mm. we, but when we understand, we talked about the oceans before, the ocean has 130 macro, micro, trace, and ultra trace elements. Now, that circumnavigates the world. The salt spray circumnavigates the world. And in very low concentrations, all of the trace elements are present. I may have asked you this question before how much, if you take a plant, dehydrate it because it's got 70% water just like we have, and, and you look at the, the actual content, physical content left, what percentage of that content came from the atmosphere and what percent came from the soil? Uh, pass. Go on, tell me. 95% came from the atmosphere. Clearly, CO2 makes carbohydrates. Nitrogen yep. initially came from the atmosphere, make protein. But all the trace elements are present. Now, to back that up, there are air plants uh, which I have close by. This is an air plant. It hasn't been watered, so it's dried. Yeah. But that grew completely out of the out of the atmosphere. Yes. Uh, Patterson's curse grows in copper deficient soil, right? Mm-hmm. What does Patterson's curse concentrate in a copper deficient soil? Well, it's copper deficient, and it, it's harvesting elements from the atmosphere. Yeah. It specialises in concentrating copper. Right. Yeah. So that's one example. If you take a rose bush and you analyze the soil initially, there'll be no, no, no titanium unless it's got a high titanium prior. Over time, the, um, the, the leaves from the rose bush, etc., which is taking titanium from the atmosphere, you will get ever increasing levels of titanium from the soil. Plants and microbes build soil, whereas Chemical fertilizers eventually destroy soils. The soils destroy structure, making it more prone to erosion, et cetera. It stops the soil blues, et cetera, et cetera. It's just wrong. Mm-hmm. Not, yeah. Now, Chris, you also talk about deserts, and I think you've, you've alluded to some of that here. And, and deserts are a growing problem. I mean, they're, they're expanding literally as we speak. Um, how, you, you're talking about a project you've got to green up the deserts. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, greening the desert, and if anyone listening here has a property in arid or degraded land, contact me uh, uh, via um, Ron or contact me on growing yep. at gmail.com. Yeah, we'll have links to that. Yeah, sure. So, uh, fortunately, I have someone who's... Uh, volunteer to cooperate we're only get doing a, a hectare as a proof of concept essentially we're it's a stratified approach so we're working from the tree level right down to the soil level and beyond 
So what are we doing? Okay, we need to plant trees because they attract water. 80% of the moisture in a desert that hits the ground comes from condensation from trees. 80%, not from, only 20% from rainfall. 80%. So the more trees you can plant, the more condensation you can get, the more moisture you get in the soil, which is critical. So how do you speed that process up? I've been working on a concept called seed bombs, and we're probably going to call them seeds of hope, seed bombs, which we release from um, drones in a very regulated and precision-like manner. And we can we take the seed, we then soak the seed in our 500 different species of microbes, which do multiple functions, including reducing the amount of water required. We then um, put... Uh, uh, hydrogels or polymers which are water retentive and expand up to 2,000 times and give a slow release of water. We then, uh, this is a more difficult stage, we then ideally will coat that seed bomb with a super hydrophilic substance which is non-toxic from polymers which will one condense uh, water vapor from the atmosphere then once that, sorry, absorb the water vapor from the atmosphere, then condense the water vapor, and then inflate the beads of hydrogels, which inflate, plus organic uh, fertilizer. So it's got different layers to it. And we can drop those from bombs, and we do it, uh, seed bombs, and we can do it, we, we will strategically work with the contours, uh, probably uh, do some earthworks, as in swales or buns, uh, then we, we then drop those in a very dense fashion. So we get a, very, a, a lot of little seedlings growing. And it's known, there's a Japanese uh, forester, if you plant densely, you get 10 times the rate of growth. And you're creating a little microclimate, which will then have its own uh, cycling of nutrients and water, which is critical, right? So that's, that's the first phase. The second part is we use the soil inoculant of the 500 microbes sprayed by drones or planes or helicopters or from quad bikes or tractors or whatever. And they massively change the soil in structure. So we're sculpting that we're, we're structuring the soil above ground through earthworks, but we're structuring the soil itself with microbes and they create these little chalices to receive water and also have that increased surface area for nutrient cycling. We, I fail to say, after we soak the seed in the 500 different species, we then coat that with spores of an endophytic fungi, which do two things, increase the drought resilience and also increase the capacity of that plant to grow in salty soil if we're using bore water as an irrig irrigating uh, source. Uh, so we, we're working very much to try and choose uh, salt resilient or resistant plants, but we increase the capacity of that plant to have uh, water, which is high in salt from bore water, which is quite available. So when is we... the initial, initial moisture coming from more water because yeah. over a desert, you know, you've just kind of outlined bare ground dust is not yeah. very, is hydrophobic. It, it just depends. Uh, ideally, we'd like to do it without any external irrigation. Okay. Uh, but uh, if we need to start it off. But the other thing about the hydrogels or the polymers is that there's been work done in Tanzania and United Arab Emirates. When you add three grams of this water retaining crystals to a, a little seedling that you plant, say, manually, or even a crop, you only need to water twice within the growing cycle. Right. But for a, for a seedling, a tree seedling, you just need to get it established. And particularly if it's got lots of others around, it creates a microclimate, and you're getting 80% of that water condensation from the night desert air atmosphere. So, so it depends on whether we can actually get the right um, highly water absorbent uh, outer coat, uh, whether it's economically feasible, it has to be non-toxic, et cetera. 
the, they do exist, but I've, I've been doing quite a bit of research in that area. So it's yet to be finalized. But even if we don't use the hydrophilic, super hydrophilic outer coat, we've still got a seed bomb, which has got uh, the water attentive agent in it. And there's always going to be some rain in the desert or we can supplement with external. Uh, and, and how soon would you start to expect some greening occurring? Uh, look, with all the other things we're adding to it, um, let's call them seeds of hope, um, they germinate quite quickly. I mean, I've been doing experiments, but not in an arid setting. But certainly, um, look, it, it depends on the species, you know, but uh, we, the main thing is that when we add the water attentive uh, crystals, if we're doing manual planting, which is uh, 25 times slower and 80% more expensive, you get 99.5% viable growth. Wow. In other words, you reduce the, the tree mortality significantly. There's a, a native to Australia called Comelina Sinai. It's got a little blue flower like cyanide blue. And if you plant that in an agricultural context, you reduce the irrigation by 75% because it doesn't evapotranspire. Wow. It's a creeper and it doesn't require many nutrients. It's very shallow rooted, but it will keep that ground covered. Now, I proposed this to a group in Egypt called Sekem, S-E-K-E-M, that farms the desert. And they get the water from the lateral flow of water from the Nile, but they basically had sand, added compost, 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 and they're, over 30 years, they're now highly productive. And I said, use the Comalina sign, I'll send you a sample. And they said, it won't tolerate the hot conditions. I, when I go for my walks, I'm always looking at vegetation and collect things along the way. And there was a, a, a Comalina cyanide growing on the cement pavement in the crack. <laughs> now that was getting full blown heat. Now what it did as another adaptive mechanism, it you know how you can curl your tongue up, it curled the leaf up to reduce evaporation, but it was viable. Therefore, it should grow in hostile conditions. Yeah. Now, now, now Chris, let's just we're going to finish up because I, I I mean we there's so much to talk about, but I wondered if we might just say what are the top three interventions? Let's just summarise them to reverse climate change by, say, 2030. I like to hear positives here. I yeah, know right. you've got well, them. Well, <laughs> farm the atmosphere. Farm the atmosphere. Yeah. Uh, keep all the ground covered all the time by diverse species cover crop. Build a soil carbon sponge by organic matter plus uh, soil inoculants, which creates that soil carbon sponge keeping in mind the soil carbon sponge is made up of organic matter, which initially came from the atmosphere by way of carbon dioxide, and water vapour condenses. So it's drawing down the water vapour and the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, creating a soil carbon sponge, which makes a reservoir for storing water. So a 1% increase in soil carbon will increase the water holding capacity by 144,000 litres per hectare. Mm. And, and and no till which goes in hand in hand with cover cropping no till means you don't disturb the soil structure which means that you don't oxidize the soil and you've got those communication networks the 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 wood wide web <laughs> the communication networks through the fungi um is primarily that and certainly don't don't plow the soil or add chemicals which destroy the soil structure and the soil microbiome. Mm. So I always enjoy catching up. It's always a uh, grounds for hope when we speak. And uh, I think we need to be hearing more of these kind of messages and particularly one that takes such a holistic view of it. Christo, I know this is a big topic, uh, but you, I, I know you also say it's not the CO2, it's the H2O that we need to deal with. Can you explain that and, you know, go into that a bit? We are very ascended around carbon dioxide, but uh, tell us some more. Yeah, look, we have to look at the historical perspective. In 1958, Charles Keeling did the ex extraordinary work of measuring CO2 and noticed it was going up. And it was also noted that the 
the average atmospheric temperature was going up and it was sort of a, a faded of complete, you know, um, cause effect correlation was made, but they coexist. They don't necessarily, one doesn't necessarily cause the other as a major driver of climate change. So because now the reason Keeling did that was that in order to model climates of the future and make projections, he said, water is so ubiquitous, so ephemeral and so dominant, there's no way in hell that you can model it. Mm. And he added to that, he said, well, it's so dominant that surely mankind's activity can't make a difference. Therefore, to simplify it, we'll just take water out of the equation. But since that time with NASA and monitoring from space, we can monitor it. And the estimates are, again, it's flexible because it's so changeable moment to moment, is between 60 to 80% of the greenhouse gas effect is from water vapor. Now, let's look at the molecule of water. It's a 120 degree angle. That means that it traps incoming radiation as water vapor, not as cloud, but it also, that, that's short wave, but CO2 doesn't trap the short wave radiation from the sun. When those short wave radiation hits the ground, it's then reflected as long wave radiation and carbon dioxide can trap the long wave radiation as does water vapor, but there's slight differences in the amount to which they trap that heat. Putting them together, they both trap the long wave radiation. So it's an additive, it's actually a multiplier effect. Again, there's variable estimates for any input of greenhouse gas, of anthropogenic gases, there is at least a twofold to fivefold increase in temperature from water vapor. So the more the simple analogy is you've got a pot of water and you're turning up the gas and that's analogous to the green the anthropogenic gases. You're going to create more water vapor at a faster rate, right? Mm -hmm. Now that water vapor is the dominant greenhouse gas. And to reinforce that, if we didn't have the mantle of water vapor in the atmosphere, our earth would be 33 degrees colder. Mm -hmm. right? So it's a greenhouse gas. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but it also multiplies the effect of the anthropogenic greenhouse gases. Mm. So when we aim for, for net zero by 2050, this, it's problematic for the following reasons. Whatever it peaks at parts per million, you know, whatever it is, it's currently uh, 418 parts per million of CO2, whatever it peaks at by 2050, we will have that legacy for hundreds of years to come because it's a very stable molecule. Furthermore, prior to the Industrial Revolution, there was more CO2 in the ocean than there was in the atmosphere. So you had an efflux of CO2 from the oceans to the atmosphere. When we reach a point hundreds of years from now, when the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere is less than CO2 in the oceans, and by the way, 30% of CO2 goes to the oceans per, per year. We will have the exit of all that CO2 in the atmosphere, uh, oceans back into the atmosphere. So we're looking at thousands of years from now. And we're already facing crises now at the current level of CO2. Whereas water vapor being the dominant greenhouse gas, I say there's too much of a good thing in the wrong place. Let's see water vapor as an untapped resource. If we have cows and trees to seed the clouds, then we're getting more rainfall and the clouds in themselves reflect incoming radiation. If we build a soil carbon sponge, we're keeping more water in the ground. A 0.4% increase in soil carbon will increase the amount of water in the soil by 37.5 trillion litres. Hmm. That sounds like a big number. Yeah, so I can't remember the top of my head how many trillions of litres of water vapour there is, but it's obviously mm. more than that. But if we make the soil receptive to infiltration, percolation and storage of water in the ground, that problem of the greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, water vapour, becomes the resource. Mm. 
if mm. we add trees and ground cover, which are the, the, the air conditions of the planet, we're cooling the planet more. I see it this way. Water vapor is involved in 85, 95% of the heat transfer of the planet. Hmm. Interesting. Right? So if you, if you have an ice cube and you add heat to it, then it goes to water vapor, then it goes, sorry, goes to water, then it goes to water vapor. Heat is transferred through those three different states of water, right? So if we want to change the heat budget of the planet, we need to get more condensation of water, water vapor, by seeding clouds and by storing the water in plants or soil. Major difference. And as we said before, a 5% increase in transpiration will stabilize the climate. But I'm talking about reversing climate change mm, mm. by building soil which can contain water so it becomes a sponge which can hold water but also breathe, uh, breathe and cycle nutrients. Which is coming back to the story about the importance of soil. Soil, but more particularly, what what are the who are the geoengineers? They're soil microbes. And everything we do in conventional agriculture destroys the microbes. Everything. Yeah. Be it fungicides, biocides, herbicides, pesticides, plowing the soil destroys the soil structure. And the green revolution across the planet has destroyed the soil structure. When you destroy the soil structure, it's no longer stable. So it's prone to erosion. Well, this green revolution, of course, uh, has delivered us seemingly cheap food. And I say seemingly cheap because it might be appear cheap in the supermarket, but the costs to human health and planetary health are enormous. So the green revolution has benefited some. It's certainly caused a lot of obesity. That's part of the problem. But uh, it's created and it's helped create uh, the environmental degradation that we're seeing today. Yeah, it comes to price point differences. The organic food is more expensive. Uh, they say it's 20% on average more, but that, that's highly variable. But it's got 30 more, more percent nutrients. So therefore, you, you, eat, you can eat less. Hmm. The second thing is the true cost, there's a movement called true cost of canning. The true cost of conventional food is double what you pay. So if you go and buy a McDonald's hamburger for three bucks, it's actually six bucks in terms of the health cost and the planetary health costs that you mentioned. Mm. So we don't, because those costs aren't included, they're externalized costs, they're not included in the price structure, we're, not, we're getting a false perception of the true cost of that food we're buying. Thank you so much for joining us today again and sharing your wisdom. We'll have links to your site, of course, so people can find out and learn more. Thank you so much. I enjoy talking to Christos because he reframes um, some of the issues and sees what many see as a problem and tries to work out a way of making them a resource. His whole um, discussion, a discussion about carbon dioxide as a resource, the alerting us to the importance of water, but the water cycle, hydrology, as also being an integral part of climate change and the fact that by increasing ground cover, I thought that was so interesting to look at the ground within a few metres of each other, one that had lush growth on it, very low temperature. Next to that, the, the mode, it had, it, the, that vegetation had been mowed, so there was mulch on the ground covering the, the growth and the temperature rose, and next to that was bare soil. And I think if we extrapolate that onto the global stage, we get a sense of what is going on, and that is so much bare soil is increasing ground temperature, which has a flow-on effect to um, air temperature and affects uh, soil loss, that, that statistic of between 25 and 75 billion tonnes of soil being lost every, every year is an enormous issue, and the fact that dust in the atmosphere is actually hydrophobic. So that means not water loving or hydrophilic. And, and this is why it's such an such, so important to take a holistic approach to this and also why animals are such an important part of this process because uh, to grow soil, I, I, I know that it takes nature 
500 years to grow two and a half centimetres or one inch of soil. Now, when you're losing soil at 25 to uh, 75 billion tonnes a year, um, taking 500 years to grow soil back is just uh, not going to really do it. So we actually need to engage with regenerative agricultural practices because in a well-managed in regenerative agricultural farm that uses ruminants, that, that resource constructively in, an, in, a, in a holistic way, you can regrow one inch or 2.5 centimetres of soil in three to five years, not 500 years, three to five years. And that is why the resource of animal agriculture is so important. Industrial animal agriculture, animals locked up in feedlots or in pens or in cages, I think that's terrible. It's terrible for the animal. It's terrible for the quality of the meat that we have. It's terrible for the planet and it's terrible for our health. So I don't have any argument about that. But to just completely ignore animals as part of the solution is naive at best and totally negligent at worst. So I think they they have a very important part to play in terms of regenerating the soil microbiome, improving organic matter within the soil, improving the ability of the soil to deliver nutrients to the plants that either the animals eat or that we eat, and increasing the amount of water within the soil. This takes us back to the, the podcast I did with uh, Charlie Massey, and he talked about the five cycles that are the solar cycle, uh, that is photosynthesis, remember that from uh, year seven uh, or first year high school in biology, the solar cycle, uh, the water cycle, uh, which is all about increasing organic matter in the soil to regenerate, uh, to, to hold soil, uh, hold water in the soil, the soil mineral cycle, which is all about the microbes, the mycorrhizal fungi. In a healthy teaspoon of soil, we have about a million, a billion microbes. In a healthy cubic metre of soil, we have 27,000 kilometres of mycorrhizal fungi. They are the fine hairs which go there. So we have the solar cycle, the water cycle, the soil mineral cycle, which involves you and me and every, um, every uh, farmer and consumer in the world is the human social cycle. So this is really where holistic approach hits the ground, you know, literally hits the ground and affects every aspect of our health. Look, we'll have links to Christos' site. Um, I hope you I hope this finds you well. Until next time, this is Dr. Ron Early. This podcast provides general information and discussion about medicine, health, and related subjects. The content is not intended and should not be construed as medical advice or as a substitute for care by a qualified medical practitioner. If you or any other person has a medical concern, he or she should consult with an appropriately qualified medical practitioner. Guests who speak in this podcast express their own opinions, experiences and conclusions.